Uh, my name is Stephen Thomas, and today I'm going to talk about the top 14 integration challenges that I've ran into in the past 14 years. So let's do a quick about me. I'm an 11-year integration MVP. I'm a Pluralsight author. I have two courses out there right now, one on Intro to BizTalk 2013 and one on the ESB Toolkit. So if you're not familiar with the inner workings of simple ESB Toolkit um, solutions, that would be a good course to uh, check out. I run two community sites. Uh, one is biztalkgurus.com, which is uh, really more the community site. And then my personal uh, resume site, which is biztalkguru.com. Uh, in the past 14 years, I've worked at over 21 different client sites. So I've had the um, ability to see a bunch of different BizTalk solutions, a bunch of different BizTalk environments, and seeing very different maturity levels across those 21 different clients. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Stephen W. Thomas, and feel free to email me anytime. It's simply me at either biztalkgurus.com or biztalkguru.com. I'll, I'll get it either way. Um, let's do a quick recap from last year. So last year I came to the summit and I left my wife, my three-year-old, and a two-week-old at home to come over here and present. Uh, to give you an idea, this is why I've been sleeping since then. <laughs> um, I think I'm finally getting to the point where I'm getting out of the doghouse. Um, last year I talked on Azure Infrastructure as a Service, which I still think is a very valuable topic and applies pretty well to the BizTalk um, way of doing things because we have good BizTalk templates and environments out there that we can create. And I showed us how we can use PowerShell scripts to actually script the automatic creation of these domains. So an overview of what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to review the top challenges and difficulties I've ran into in the past 14 years. The goal of doing this is to give you something to think about and hopefully give you a list of things to try to avoid as you start either new BizTalk projects or new integration projects, or even apply these to uh, current situations that you face at your, uh, your clients today. So with that, let's get started with point 14, which is finding skilled resources. So a lot of times I get brought on to a project and we're ramping up a new integration team, and they talk about how they want to convert their .NET resources into BizTalk resources. Um, it's been my experience that there's usually a lot of challenges associated with moving someone from .NET to BizTalk. Um, generally, the first thing they try to do is apply logic to a BizTalk solution, which is generally the first thing you don't want to do. Um, they'll deploy a new uh, solution, try to edit a send port, and get a concurrency violation, and then everything's kind of downhill from there. Um, so there are a lot of challenges associated with you know, finding skilled BizTalk resources. Um, my greatest um, success in mentoring new resources was actually with two DBA developers who we had to actually start back at what is remote desktop and what is Visual Studio, but it, I was also able to mold them exactly the way I wanted them. So that actually came out to be pretty good. So one of the good ways to avoid this challenge is to help stress to your management and your other team members that getting someone that's skilled in BizTalk is definitely a big benefit for the project. And I tend to want to find a guy like this. I think that's the George Clooney of BizTalk right there. Um, so he's, he looks a little more like he can, he can handle the problems. Uh, so uh, challenge number 13 is having too much production access. Um, this is something I continue to see from client to client. Um, one case, I was called in about uh, 10 AM in the morning. Uh, they were having a critical production issue. They brought in a whole team of five of us. Uh, and by 1 o'clock that night, it was actually now Saturday morning, we ended up starting a support call with Microsoft and tracing through uh, SQL queries and, uh, and database dumps to try to figure out why their environment went from 80 messages a second down to 20. Uh, about 12 hours into the call, we, we discovered that a developer logged in, changed the receive location store procedure to add a top one clause because they thought having an order would be better. Uh, that simple change by that developer wasn't known by anybody except for him, and that wasted a lot of time and had a huge production outage because of that. Uh, so one of the things that uh, most projects implement is an operations team that actually uh, does those kinds of changes in production so the developers don't have access. And while it can be a big pain to have to deal with these operations teams, it's definitely beneficial in the long run. We get to number 12 that's actually following a naming standard. Um, this is something that seems relatively simple, 
but most clients don't actually have a well-defined BizTalk naming standard. Um, it becomes even more important because in BizTalk, we have a lot of different artifacts. That's BAN, Visual <laughs> Studio, BizTalk Admin Console, all over. And it seems like whenever there's a really important name, we have like that little much space to actually read it. Um, I don't know how I keep trying to hover over it again to get the name to repop back up. Um, but having a well-defined naming standard where we don't prefix the name with a whole lot of gobbledygook can really help us save time in the long run when looking uh, at these artifacts and helping to understand them. So point number 11, developing, developing a build and deployment process. Uh, I was at one client that was doing a manual deployment every morning of the BizTalk solution into the test environment. Uh, this took two to three hours every single day. Uh, I invested 40 hours in building an MS build based deployment process, which cut that time down to about 30 minutes. So not only did we save hours every day, but now we could do multiple, multiple deployments within a day and the client could actually see a huge improvement in the, the speed at which we were testing the solution. So it really is important to help stress to management the, the, uh, the payoffs that come with investing in a build and deployment process. And with this, of course, the BizTalk deployment framework helps out a lot in, in making this a much more straightforward uh, process than it used to be. So point 10 is understanding the data. I would say in pretty much all integration solutions that we build, the data is pretty critical to the environment, um, to, to the enterprise. So whether it's a customer uh, order, you know, wanting to purchase a new TV, or it's a delivery confirmation email, or an insurance claim, that data is mission critical. As us as integrators have the unique ability to be able to see a lot of data across the whole enterprise. So whether we like it or not, we tend to be the go-to resource for simple data questions in other systems that we don't even own. Um, a good example of this was I was on a large e-commerce project where we were taking orders out of commerce server and sending them to the backend systems. Uh, the commerce server catalog lead actually quit and they, I guess you could call it promoted me from the integration team to be the commerce server's catalog lead. So knowing nothing about commerce server, I was the catalog lead for about a month until they found a replacement. So those of us as, as integrators, I guess it's a, a plus that we can be in this unique situation where we can be valuable enough to be able to move to other teams outside of integration because we're the ones that get to see all the different data in that enterprise. I did move back and I found that point 14, find the skilled resource. They actually followed that and, and got a good commerce server lead in there. Okay, this slide talks about using the ESB toolkit. So two years ago, this would have been the slide, but now I've updated it to using the ESB toolkit incorrectly. Um, I've walked into two client sites now that were both excited about using the ESB toolkit, but couldn't have done things more wronger than if they, than they did on that solution. Um, what you need to understand with using a toolkit is it's simply that. It takes custom development and enhancement to get that toolkit to really apply to you know, every scenario, but more importantly, to your specific scenario. Um, both these clients um, had significant, significant um, performance issues in production, and we ended up reworking the whole, uh, both whole sets of code to leverage the ESB toolkit where it made sense to. Um, it's also important to remember that if you're using a toolkit, you don't really need to force everything through that toolkit. So it's knowing when to apply the toolkit and when not, and making sure it's adding value to your solution instead of just saying that you're being an ESB-based uh, solution. Point number eight, planning capacity properly. Uh, again, I've been on multiple clients where we've lost days of testing because SQL Server was out of disk space. The whole testing environment completely shuts down, nobody knows what's going on, and something as simple as adding more disk space could have saved all these projects countless amounts of money. So it's, it's always a challenge to how to much capacity to plan. Uh, from a production side, I generally see either one of two things. One, they have four BizTalk servers to process three messages an hour, or they have two BizTalk servers to try to process 300 messages a second. So it's definitely a challenge to plan capacity correctly. And this is one of the great areas where moving some of our components into the cloud can really help with that. This can help with our 
gives us more forgiveness, I would say, on having to plan our capacity because we can add that capacity in the cloud much uh, quicker and more cost effective than having to build it on our, um, our own hardware. So as we think about planning capacity, we want to make sure we do it not only in our production environment, but in our non-production environments as well so that we don't hit those downtimes uh, in those uh, other environments. Point seven is creating automated unit tests. Um, it's definitely been my experience that the hardest part about doing unit tests for BizTalk is defining what is a unit test. Um, I was on one project where they said running an orchestration is not considered a unit test. That's a functional test, so you're not allowed to run an orchestration. Uh, I was on another project where they invested a lot of money in building schema unit tests, which I don't really see a whole lot of value in having uh, schema unit tests. Uh, so really creating automated unit tests that make sense to your solution and that add value has definitely proven to be a well-worthy uh, way to spend money on a project. Um, I tend to look at more of a functional approach. So I'm going to drop in a file. I'm going to run through some simulated service calls using um, SOAP UI and then evaluate those results to make sure my BizTalk maps are functioning, my send ports are functioning, and that everything else uh, internally is working as expected. So investing the time in creating the unit tests has definitely proven to pay off. Point number six, thinking BizTalk is like .NET. I've seen a lot of clients that, that want to try to apply FX cop rules to their BizTalk orchestration solutions. Um, even ones that have said the underscore underscore variable names had to be fixed, even though that's all you know, internal to the orchestration. Um, for some reason, people tend to think BizTalk is .NET more so than, than SharePoint. I don't, I don't see people uh, you know, thinking SharePoint is BizTalk. Um, I guess it's because you have the flexibility to build so many different custom c -sharp components in there. Um, so it is important to you know, apply your correct uh, naming standards to the custom components, but it's also important to stress to, to management that BizTalk is a server component and that we really have to play by its rules when we're developing uh, uh, custom components for it. Point number five is having environments out of sync. Um, usually production tends to be the only multi-server environment when I come to, uh, uh, to come to a client site. And there hasn't been a single time where we've went and done a production uh, or done an install from a single server environment into a multi-server environment and didn't detect some kind of problem uh, in the, either in the deployment process or in the binding files. Somewhere along the way, having that multi-server environment sooner would have definitely helped us out. Uh, this is one of the key areas where having the Azure domains available to us where we can even just do these uh, deployment testing, this can really help us out. Uh, so having environments out of sync isn't necessarily just related to the number of servers, but the code that's installed on those servers also has to uh, remain consistent or you're going to see inconsistent results. Um, I went to one client that actually had Skype running on the production BizTalk box. Um, <laughs> just on one of the nodes, though, so I, I guess that was okay. Um, and obviously they didn't have that in their other boxes. Gets back to the point about developers having too much admin access as well. Point four, involving production support too late. Um, out of all the areas that they estimate uh, on projects, my experience has been production support is definitely the, the bottom, uh, the, most un uh, the most wrongly estimated uh, part of the project. Uh, a lot of clients think that they can just uh, de de deploy this BizTalk solution and it's just gonna hum along and not gonna have any problems, not gonna have to do any support and maintenance on it. Um, what I found is the earlier that we can educate a client that they need to involve production support sooner rather than later, the better it ends up being uh, in the long run. Um, I like to try to involve production support even when we start testing, actually get them testing some things on their own so that they can begin to understand kind of the way systems work. Um, I get really annoyed when production support says, well, give me a list of all the errors and how to fix them. Because um, that's kind of a, an open-ended question, because BizTalk has errors, the systems it integrate, integrates with has errors, and then there's custom errors that, that we have introduced um, you know, in, in Logic. So really having an overall list is, a, is definitely a challenge to come up with. So making sure we involve pr production support at the right time is definitely critical. Point number three is allowing operations to drive business requirements. I've been at two separate clients where their operations team were the strongest, most powerful team in that whole organization. No matter 
how many times you would have a re review with them. If you came to do a deployment and they didn't like something, even if um, the, you, know, you just had something spelled wrong or, or they didn't like the name, they would make you go back and correct it before they would deploy it in that environment. Um, in, these, in these cases, the business was even powerless to even override what these operators said. So it really, it's really an organizational issue and not something that we can really have much control over. But it's understanding when you're in one of these situations and how to navigate it to make sure that you don't see additional delays in your project because of this. Um, in all fairness, uh, both those operations teams had to deal with those really, really bad ESB solutions. Um, so they had good reason on uh, why they were very cautious of having uh, new code deployed. Point number two is over-architecting. Uh, I've seen some solutions where they have so many different BizTalk applications and so many different BizTalk projects that number one, the deployment is so complex. And number two, their idea of getting reuse for these down the road, well, in my experience, I've never really seen good reuse of any component uh, that, that we've developed uh, down the road. Um, so I think having the right architecture, the right balance of uh, reusability versus complexity is really key. And this is one of the great areas where I think the micro microservices is really going to help us out, as we can define things not just at the service level, but even at a more microservice level to be a more isolated unit of work. I think that's going to help simplify our architectures uh, overall. And now for the last slide that's keeping you from drinks. The number one integration challenge is integrators become too smart. So why is this a challenge? Um, how many people here have received a call or email that says, BizTalk is broken, everything's not working, it's all BizTalk's fault? <laughs> Pretty much everybody. Um, so then what we end up doing is spending a lot of time debugging other people's code, looking at other people's databases, and pretty much finding out all the things the other teams that we're dealing with are doing wrong. So then we become the people that now have to tell them all these things that they're doing wrong. So, Point number one really shouldn't be integrators become too smart. It should really be, we need to be delicate at how we break the news to the other teams <laughs> that in fact we have proof that they did not find a mistake in BizTalk. And that gets them looking like that. And that's it, any questions? No, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>